Before I introduce our guest, since this is kind of uh, relevant to part of this topic here, I wanted to read a letter that I was forwarded by a, a source of trustworthiness. Uh, this was an email from an American Traffic Solutions representative to the Pinellas County uh, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant of the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office. Uh, very polite, of course. <clears throat> I have attached this past week's police rejection report for you to view. Oh, if you don't know, um, what happens when you get your picture taken is those pictures are sent over to Arizona. Arizona screens them for things that they think might be violations, and they send them over to the uh, municipality for final review. And this guy seems to be a little bit upset about uh, our review process. I attached this past week's police rejection report for you to view. This will give you information as to what each officer is reviewing, what they are rejecting, and, and, <clears throat> and breaks it down in, in graph view to make it easier to view. I've also included a few examples showing rejected events by the officers where, where based on the business rules set up, the business rules set up, seem to be valid events. By all means, if you have the business rules or the examples that I have attached are not correct, I'll be more than happy to have this discussion to make sure our processing leaders and myself are on the same page as you and your staff. And in bold, uh, currently, we are at 78.8% acceptance rate, which is not bad, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Ideally, we would like in the mid to upper 80s. Slow roll rejections seem to be the most used rejection with the 29th of the past week. Um, this was sent around and um, they, they obviously have a quota that they like to meet for all the things that they send to the thing. 80% uh, seems to be that their acceptance rate. If that's not about money, I don't know what it is. <laughs> anyway, I would like to introduce our featured guest speaker, Mr. Mark Schmitter of the Fully Informed Jury Association of Florida. Hello. In my personal opinion, he is a Liberty Superstar. Mm -hmm. uh, been arrested uh, good well, only twice. Just twice. Yeah. Just twice for exercising his First Amendment rights. Uh, Mark Smith. Thank you. Do you want me to proceed here? Uh, no, I can do it here. I don't care. Until my feet wear out. Um, okay, uh, I have a number of things I could address here. And uh, one of them would be fully in PJA, fully informed jury association, and how I ended up doing it would be one topic. Another one could be uh, the red light cameras and how I ended up doing that. And then the other one could be going to jail and what experience that's like. Because uh, a lot of us are just have such a fear, maybe justified, of going to jail that we want to stay so far away and so safe that maybe we're ineffective. But for somebody like me who's gone to jail, it's not like the third world. And it's not like what the police tell you it's like. Um, and I'm just going to briefly go into this, and then I'm going to go back to how I ended up doing all of this. So uh, jail is, um, it's, first of all, it's all about the money. That's for sure. Absolutely. And um, I can give you some examples of that. I mean, I could, I could suck up 40 minutes here just talking about jail. Yes, ma'am? Is it possible to do it on the stage? So sure. This one? That one? Does that make any difference? And also, let me get the podium. Let me get this first. Yeah. Thanks. All right. You as I'm ahead of the round table, this is wonderful. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to how I ended up uh, just getting involved. Because basically, most of my life, I was always opinionated. But I never really went with the opinionate, opinions more than my immediate family and how much beer I drank at the local DFW. I mean, it just kind of like stayed in that area. I, I researched it, and I, I paid attention to the news, but I didn't know the real news. I knew they were lying, but I... I was a contractor for 30 years, I still am, I'm a commercial roofing contractor. But uh, 
back in uh, 07, when everything started headed south, I basically was losing my business, and then um, it just everything really went crazy. And in the end, a lot of it because I wasn't paying attention is uh, my retirement. I basically lost in the stock market. I didn't pay enough attention to what was going on, and I always seem to have a positive outlook about whatever's happening. I always think things would get better. That was real foolish in 08, and I did. <laughs> so what happened was in 08, um, I thought I could retire, so I, I kind of like took a 09 off in 08, and I started understanding how important Ron Paul was to, to all of us. And I, I put my efforts there, and then I got into Campaign for Liberty in Orlando, and then I met some really interesting people, finally. Because generally, you just kind of hang out with whatever whatever your interest would be. You know, I used to race sailboats, and then, you know, we just go over all over state, and I never, always figured politics were really due to somebody else took care of me, you know. And uh, I grew up in, the, I'm 66 years old, so I grew up in the 50s, and my dad always would tell us that, um, well, if we could just get rid of the communists, everything would be okay. The commies. The commies, the pinkos, and the fags. That was his, you know. And he was extremely prejudiced. By that statement, you know he is. So anyhow, to try to get through this, and I'm not really a public speaker, I'm a contractor again. So um, I, I got with these people, and it was just eye-opening. I started looking at folks, and I went, wow, I never knew this. I never knew this. And it was just like one thing after another. It was like somebody was pulling the curtain back from the, uh, the, the Wizard of Oz, and I was seeing who was pushing the levers. This is fantastic. So naturally, as I started to leave, my friends in the scuba club and the sailing club and the bicycle clubs kept spending more time with liberty-minded people. Um, it was like I was reborn. You know, I found out what was really going on, and there was mostly lies that the corporate mainstream media was telling us. So, um, um, in 09, I guess, I just almost took a year off and just studied things, and um, uh, constantly was writing my congressman and making phone calls, and just, just doing the whole thing. I mean, I was sucking up 20 or 30 hours a week on this. And after doing it for a year or so, I'm going, is this doing any good? I, I, I'm not getting any feedback. You know, and even though I sent the petition up and got this signed and worked real hard for uh, for Ron Paul in, in, in 08 and all that, I'm going, did it work? You know, what are we doing? I'm getting smarter, I guess. I'm getting a lot of information, but I'm not getting feedback if anything's happening. And then in the summer of 10, or sometime during 10, I, um, uh, FIJA, Fully Informed Jury Association out of Helena, Montana, they sent a guy named James Cox around Florida, they were paying him, to introduce us into Fiji, Fiji, and I didn't know what it was. So he would come down, we went over to Orange County Courthouses, and that was where it really started for me. And we're handing out flyers, and you know, I would go ahead just out of my pocket, I had more money then, and I'd, I'd spend 400 bucks and get 10,000 flyers, and, and I was just dedicated, because and as Gandhi said, you know, first they ignore you, then they fight you, and then you won. Well, they were ignoring me, uh, us, for about six months, and then they started to fight us, and I knew I was headed in the right direction. You know, that was, once they started to come out and challenge you, they should have never done that. So anyhow, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, that was the one like, oh, are you going to question me why I'm handing out a flyer about jury nullification? Hmm, okay, we'll be here tomorrow. I was going to take off. <laughs> you know, we'll come down here in the morning. So uh, anyhow, with uh, James Cox, he got us going, and, and he would like leave and go to another city. You know, he'd head south, come over here to Tampa, and Pinellas, Calabas, and do that. And then he sent down a, a, a elderly gentleman, an uh, 80 year old man named Julian Heitland. Now, Julian is one of those people. He's 80 years old, and it's like talking to Julian is like you walked into the Liberty Library. Uh, it was unbelievable. This gentleman has been arrested 43 times and incarcerated six. And he's a retired chemistry professor out of Philadelphia. And he just knows so much. He knows exactly what to do to keep from getting arrested. But how much, how much you have to go up there? I mean, we're not really there to taunt him. We're there to help the country. So I just clung to Julian, and then I got to know him so well whenever he'd come to Orlando. Because the only reason he came to Orlando is if there was a bridge contest over in Disney World somewhere, because he would play bridge, and, and uh, 
that's when I started seeing more and more, and we got friendlier and friendlier, and he showed me how to hand them out, what to say, what to do, what not to do, and gave me his experience as we get interrupted, because it isn't just Fiji, it was all the things before Fiji, that he only found out about Fiji a few years ago. So Julian Heitlin got me going, and we became friends, even though there's an age difference, so whenever he'd come to Orlando, I'd pick him at the airport, and he would stay at my house to cut expenses, and we'd go out to dinner and drink a little, and Nothing really slowed down Julian. I mean, even when I take him to DFW, he'd be hitting on my girlfriends all the time. So Julian, you gotta be careful with this guy. He's really aggressive. I go, Julian, she's 20 years younger than me. He goes, you don't understand when you get old. So anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> he was a real scream. I mean, he just kept me in stitches all the time. So uh, anyhow, we would go down and hand out the flyers at the courthouse and everything's going cool. So he would leave. And then we had like 10 and 15 people. Now, Orange County Courthouse is like the mother load of, of cases there. I mean, they, they sent out a flyer up to 1,100 people four days a week to get the jurors to come in. And then you call the day at the night ahead of time, computerized, punch in your jury number, and if they don't have that many cases, they'll cut it back to maybe 600. <coughs> Because they never want to come after you to be a juror, so they just put the jury poll so big, 1,100 people in one day, that for sure they're going to have at least 400 by the time it's all done, or 300 for all the cases. Because they don't want to get you mad at the government, naturally. So, so anyhow, it's uh, when it gets down to 600, maybe, those 600 people will hit the courthouse between 725 and 815. So if you're there with flyers, which we were, from the parking garage on the sidewalk, and it's important, uh, the geograph I've got to tell you these places, because they had a lot to do with me uh, getting uh, arrested, uh, at least not for a while. So we would hand them out right in the walkway. We were never in the courthouse building. We were never, like, you know, 10 feet from the front door. We never bothered anybody. So um, I started handing these things out in earnest, I guess, in September of 2010. And people would come out to me later on and thank me for handing this to me. And then even one guy came out, and, and, and I, I'm so busy handing out so many of them, I have to hold them like a deck of cards. So as people come by, once they're a few feet away, they're not coming back to take it. It's boom, 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 you know, like that. Then I'd have to have a mailbag over here. As soon as I got low, I could grab another hundred up and go boom, 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 boom. That many you're handing out. It cost me four cents each back then. I was in volume. So uh, anyhow, so we did that for a while. Oh, the guy comes up behind me. I got sometimes I forget where I am. Old age, you know, short-term memory loss. So anyhow, uh, the guy's behind me. He says, "Hey, uh, uh, does anybody pay you for this?" And I'm still going, "No, nobody pays me for it." And he goes, "Okay." He says, "Well, who pays for the flyers?" Wait a minute, get some more. Hand them out. Uh, well, I do. They're about four cents each, and there's a big cost. And he takes out and hands me a hundred-dollar bill. And he says, "Thank you very much. I really appreciate what you're doing," and walks away. Now that's never happened to me handing out anything anywhere at any time. I don't know. If that ever happened to you at Adrian yes. Maybe you would know, I guess. It, not exactly like that. Because no. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't giving him the time of day. Yeah. So, so anyhow, I said, well, this is really working, so I'm sticking with it. So I basically dropped all the other things I was doing and just focused on this one thing. Because what it was is when I was sending emails to my senators and my congressmen, I was getting so splintered just keeping track of anything's doing any good that I was just getting exasperated. So I found about jury nullification, it's wonderful. Boom, we got into it. And then I would organize it for Central Florida and James Cox would come over to my house, you know, and Julian would come over, so we had a great time. So um, I would have the flyers. Now this is real important if, if I'm trying to entertain you guys into getting into this and I'll tell you the way not to get arrested or if you do get arrested, how to do it. Boom. <laughs> okay, so so here it is. Is it, the doors open? The they want the uh, jurors there at usually eight o'clock is when the doors open. Now people are lining up like at uh, seven thirty. They'll open the doors for the jurors, not for the regular folk. So I get, we get there about seven twenty or seven twenty-five. We're going to do it again in Seminole County because they give us no grief there, and I'll, I'll go to that in a minute. So we just walk up and down here, boom, 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 hand out to maybe, it'd be 100 people in line in Orange County on a Monday morning. And then we go ahead and, and uh, hand them, go, go over to the sidewalk between the parking garage 
in the courthouse, which most everybody parks in the parking garage, so they walk by you one way or another. Some people come in from above to the side, but that's okay. We get the majority of them. So we're handing out all the flyers and everything's doing peachy keen and great, and we're doing this, and um, a friend of mine, uh, John Kurtz, he um, was arrested on uh, January 1st, about two in the morning, in, at Orange County, uh, for videotaping basically a cop doing a takedown because they were beating the heck out of this handcuffed guy on the ground. So he's doing a video of it, and the cop came over and says, you're interfering with the arrest. And he goes, okay, so he took a step back, and as he took a step back, then, then the cop came over to him again and arrested him for resisting arrest without violence, but he wasn't being arrested for anything. And that's exactly the same charge he got me last Saturday. I'm going to come to that once I hit the red cans part of my uh, lecture here, whatever you want to call it. So, um, so anyhow, there we are handing out the flyers to find. And then on that, at the very last, um, the very last of, it was July 30, or January 31st, Judge Belvin Perry. Now in any district, I'm in the 9th District Court, I don't know what it is in Pinellas. In Seminole County, it's like the 16th or 9th D District Court. There'll be one judge who's called the administrative judge for that county. So what he does is just make sure that the parking garages work and, you know, make sure the, the courthouse functions, you know. So, um, so anyhow, he issues his first administrative order. Uh, if, uh, let me see, it was 2011-03, uh, the third administrative order he wrote for uh, uh, 2011. And it said that you cannot hold, you cannot talk, or hold a sign, or give a brochure to any juror. Uh, and actually he said, uh, and if you did, you would be held, um, first of all, he's going to serve you his administrative order. That's unconstitutional because that's selective enforcement right in the very beginning. In other words, if you make a law and you say you have to hand somebody something to tell them what the law is, that means if, if you don't like Adrian, you, you give him the administrative order and the person lay over here is, you don't give that one and you let them do go about their business. But you, if you give Adrian one, then Adrian has to read it and figure out if he's gonna stay there and get arrested or leave. So I'll be very honest with you, I only have so much guts in me. I got chicken. Ah, there's this yellow streak on my back. And I just said, nope, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to jail. Well, it didn't work out that way. But anyhow, that's what I said at the time. So then we called up Julian, our, our civil disobedience expert <laughs> up there. And Julian, uh, on his own dime, flew down and uh, started handing out the flyers. And there's like eight of us there. And we're taking videos of it. And he's handing out the flyers and everything. And who? walks down the sidewalk going to the courthouse with Judge, Administrative Judge Belvin Perry himself. Now, if you haven't heard of Judge Belvin Perry, he's the one that ran the Casey Anthony trial, trial in the summer of 11. <laughs> so, you know, we definitely going to go with somebody with some notoriability here. What the heck? I never really thought this part out whatsoever. I was just there handing out flyers, minding my own business. Not quite, but anyhow. So, uh, Adrian comes down, he's handing out the flyers, they are arresting him. And we saw him and where he tried to give it to uh, Bell and Perry, because Bell and Perry to arrest somebody because you're not breaking any law, you're not breaking any ordinance, he actually has to say, arrest that person there. Judge Bell and Perry does. Now, he can get a constable to do it, naturally. But we said, well, this is it. Julian's going to jail. Nope, nothing happened. Now, the administrative order also says if you're found guilty, it's going to be jury tampering and something else. It would be a misdemeanor, and the maximum for that would be 30 days in jail. So uh, Julian couldn't get arrested. He flew back home. We're back in business in uh, February. We're handing out flyers, you know, you know, a thousand of them you know, in two days. We'll hand them out. And we're not getting any grief and time stakers on. And then Judge Belvin Perry, when the Casey Anthony trial was cranking up in about, um, it would have to be at the beginning of May, I guess, he issues his second administrative order that says anything that has to do with free speech must be done in the free speech zone, which was a 10 by 30 foot area about 250 feet out in front of the Orange County Courthouse. And we're going, well, this doesn't make sense, and it's also selectively enforced. So it says right there, we read it, anything that has to do with free speech has to be done in the free speech zone. Well, that means if you walk up to anybody and say, hey, how are you, hey, how are you doing this morning? What about that case? Uh-uh. 
If he hands you, he hands you the administrative order, you've got to walk to the free speech zone. That's what it means. And then it's selectively enforced again. So that didn't make any sense. Again, I chickened out. I admit it the second time. And we called up Julie and he says, okay, um, I'm a little busy with my campaign. He was running for something somewhere and, uh, up in his hometown in New Jersey. The libertarian candidate, matter of fact, but he only got 3% of the vote, but whatever. As soon as he was done that, a month later, he uh, flew down. Now we're talking the beginning of, uh, I might get these dates a little messed up. Uh, I guess we're talking the uh, end of June. So he comes down. Hands out the flyers by himself, and then we're even calling up Judge Belvin Perry's secretary, Julie's her name, I got on a first name basis with her, said, <laughs> would, you, would you come on down and arrest Julian so we don't have to get up so early tomorrow morning? Because you got to be there at 725 to catch all the people walking in the courthouse. They wouldn't arrest him. Three mornings in a row, I called her, they wouldn't arrest him. So we figured out that Judge Belvin Perry's administrative orders were so unconstitutional, he's not even going to enforce them. <laughs> so, um, so Julian left, flew home, and, and about a week later, usually I'm with like two or three people. A week later, I just was by myself for a short time, so they arrested me. Now, a couple things to remember. If you're ever going to put yourself in harm's way, I don't know if I like to use that term, but anyhow, to the chance of being arrested, never, never carry identification. That's one thing Julian told me. Because they can never get you. One of the things they'll try to do is get you for trespassing. But if you don't have identification, they can't. So, um, yeah, doesn't make sense, does it? No. Yeah. I'm going to come back to that one. Okay. So anyhow, Julian couldn't get arrested. He's gone. I'm handing out the flyers. And then they came up there, and the guy says to me, he says, you know you've got to be in the free speech zone. And I went, okay. And he says, you're under arrest. You know, they, they were already laying for me. Now, Julian also trained me how to get arrested. Never thought there was to be a specialty to this. But he knows. What you do is you fall to the ground and be unresponsive, and then by by their their procedure, they have to call up the an ambulance to come and get you. And then besides that, they can never say you're resisting arrest if you're laying on the ground. <laughs> and then they also won't taser you. Now that's only good in the public spot. Besides that, they don't like an 80-year-old man laying there, you know. Going to sleep, you know, because Julian's so old, you know, he goes to sleep anywhere. We're handing out flyers now, Julian. Oh, yeah, okay. So, uh, so, so right there, so I did what he did. I just went down there, and I'm playing possum. I can hear everything they're saying. They're going, oh, he's faking it, and all that. And they go, well, you know, you got to call the fire department. So the fire department comes, and the ambulance comes, two big vehicles. And they take my blood pressure and they say, well, he's, he's okay and everything. They're talking to me and say, you all right? And I'm going, mm -hmm. not saying a word. So then the guy picked me up and he put me in the ambulance. They did on a gurney. And then um, also is you take your cell phone, you put a code in it so they can't call anybody. Because with Julian's cell phone, he can't figure out how to put a code. And if they did put in a code, he'd forget what it was. So, um, so they, one time he was arrested. i got to go back to Julian. He's my mentor. They arrested him, and he's told everybody, if anybody calls you who's a, with anybody, law well, of course, I'd never tell them who I am. So they called up his wife, Susan, who I've talked to a number of times, and they say, we arrested this old man down here. Can you tell us who he is? She goes, yeah, I can tell you who he is, but he told me not to. Oh, oh that's witness tampering. Yeah, boy, they didn't like that. So anyhow, I, after Julian trained me, I had to put in the code with my fingers. And I'm peeking out of my eye in the ambulance, and the guy's got the phone up, and he's going, he can't make it work, you know, he's getting exasperated. He says, listen, anything you say in here cannot be held against you. Can you just tell me if you're okay? I mean, anything here? And I said, yeah, I'm okay, fine. He goes, all right, good. So they're still going down to Orlando Regional Medical Center. And uh, I said, yeah, I'm okay. And he says, listen, I don't blame you falling to the ground, because you would not believe how many people we pick up that are near taser to death. He said that to me. I was stunned at that one. So anyhow, we go down there, I go in the hospital, and uh, they say, you know, I'm just laying there until the cops walk out. And they go, yeah, you okay? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm not going to cause you a lot of trouble and all that. They go, okay. So we come back. They, uh, they uh, say, okay, you're okay. Can you sign this release? And I go, no, I'm not signing this release. And then they want you to sign another release that you won't sign their first release. And I go, no, I'm not signing nothing. <laughs> And they go, all right, so the cops pick me up, bring me back to Orange County Courthouse, and then uh, 
uh, in the afternoon, this is like at 9 in the morning or something, they dragged me up to the Casey Anthony trial, which is going on. She wasn't in there with the jury, but everybody else was in this gaudy, gaudy, enormous high ceiling courtroom. Because I was thinking I'd be running into Judge Belvin Perry's, uh, you know, little office in there in the back corner. And how do you, the magistrates say, how do you plea and all that. So I got in there and I, and, you know, you feel humbled inside this place. So he says, uh, well, how do you plea? And I said, not guilty or something. I don't know what I said because I wasn't even anticipating getting arrested whatsoever. So he goes, okay, <clears throat> let's get back into the cop cars, under arrest, bring me down to 33rd Street Jail and process me through the jail. And uh, <clears throat> I was out like in 12 hours later, something bothered out. And, but then I had to go to court in, 30, in uh, one week. So I went in there. And he says, okay, and he says, uh, we're gonna start. And he says, all right, and he starts hearing the case. He's bringing up witnesses and things. They go, wait a minute, may I address the bench? And they have to let you do that. I said, your honor, you should recuse yourself. You're the arresting judge, the judge, the prosecution, and also the executioner. You're all four. Mm -hmm. And he says, what else do you want to know? <laughs> and he says, uh, uh, he said, I'll say, um, also, we would like you, uh, I said, if, if you elevated this to a felony, because I had two counts, not being in the free speech zone, and also the flyer, uh, Administrative Order 03 and 07 is the free speech zone. He said, uh, uh, I said, if you elevated this, I deserve to have a uh, trial by 12 jurors of, of, of my peers. And he goes, anything else? And I went through a couple other things. He goes, denied, all of them. He says, let's hear this case. So he got the cop talking there, and I went, wait a minute. I wrote this all down from Julian. He gave me a whole list of stuff to do. And I said, Your Honor, I feel like you're trying to rock me to judgment. And that's some magical sentence that just stopped everything right in its tracks. I didn't think it would, but it just stopped everything. He says, okay, I'll see you in one week, and you're either going to defend yourself or have a uh, public defender or, uh, or a lawyer. In one week. So I get there, and the Patriots there talked up $2,500, and they uh, found a lawyer, and he said he would defend me. And we said we'd like six months, and he goes, no, nope, I'll give you one week. Came back one week later, and uh, <clears throat> they promptly uh, convicted me, sent me to jail. And then he immediately wrote an appeal, so we appealed out. I appealed out four days later. And, but they put me, it was right at the end of July, I guess, right when they. Uh, <coughs> I'm talking too much to get my horse. So, uh, yeah, thanks. So, uh, they, uh, uh, I was in there and they put me in solitary confinement, which was great. <laughs> I didn't want to be with them common criminals. Absolutely not. So, uh, but they put me in there more to protect me than to protect, um, uh, uh, them, I mean, you know, what am I going to do to somebody? So it was actually kind of nice, and you only get out 20 minutes per day to take a shower <clears throat> and use the phone. And they had me as uh, in the high risk area, and that's where the solitary confinement is. So for the four days. <clears throat> so anyhow, I uh, bought it out in four days, and, and then uh, my, for under appeal, and then. We messed around for about a year and a half, and then last, uh, I'm leaving a lot of this out, a lot of little things out. But uh, we weren't handing out flyers anymore, and actually at Orange County Courthouse, or Osceola County Courthouse, that's part of the 9th District. But then we had other people that I could be there. Oh yeah, he also put a no trespassing order on me for Orange County Courthouse. Now, how do you put a no trespassing order on <laughs> some of public property if I own it? I'm not gonna trespass myself, this doesn't make any sense. So, um, but one of the things we'd like to do is send people down there that would hand out flyers until they're handed the administrative order. It was kind of like a, you know, a badge. <laughs> we were real proud of that. And then uh, after they, we sucked up all that, I could go down to Osceola County Courthouse in, in uh, Kissimmee because I didn't have a no trespassing order there, but I couldn't hand out flyers. But we would get other people to hand them out it took about a third time before they started giving the administrative order, so then we had to abandon that. But in the meantime, we're still doing Seminole County up in Sanford every Monday morning. Now, now we only hand out about 200 flyers there for the whole week because it's so small. I mean, Orange County is the mother moon. You know, it's just wonderful to go to Orange County if you like this stuff like I do.
<clears throat> so anyhow, the uh, Fifth District of Court of Appeals in Daytona, they ruled in my favor and against Judge Perry on 07 administrative order about the free speech zone and said that's completely unconstitutional, thank God. But then, on the first administrative order, we thought we'd win that also. They know. They ruled in favor of Judge Perry, but not for anything that Judge Perry said. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense, because usually when you in the appeal process, nobody can bring up anything that wasn't covered in the original trial. You can't think of something like, oh, I should have pled this, you know, when I was in trial. You can't bring that up. However, the three-judge panel that must be friendly with Belvin, I guess, they ruled that Orange County Courthouse is not an open forum. Now try to figure that one out. If it's not an open forum, that means it's private property. That doesn't make sense. I know who owns the courthouse, and our argument to them was, well, wait a minute. What about the Supreme Court of the United States? People there petition, megaphones, have petitions signed, da 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 They do it on an hourly basis. And they come back, well, a superior court is different than a lower court. Different rules apply. That's garbage. That is garbage. That's exactly right. And I go, well, this doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> so then, February 20, 21st, I went back in for resentencing. And we figured that, well, you know, it'll be 10 days, 30 days, or maybe he'll let me stay out on appeal, because now we get an appeal up at the uh, Supreme Court of the state of Florida hanging there. Nope. He put me in for the maximum time he could, 141 days, in uh, Orange County Courthouse. And he didn't even give me a couple of days off to get my power turned off or anything. He took me right then and there, put me in. And he even told me, now he made another big mistake. He says, well, I have to make an example out of you because I've had a number of judges come up to me and tell me they're losing cases because those flyers are handed out. Uh, 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 <laughs> he should have just lied on that one. That was a big mistake, big mistake. So anyhow, uh, now, I'm, now I'm in the regular jail. And uh, what jail's like is, it's, uh, they put me, in, 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 in the beginning, they kind of float you around to figure out where they want to put you. But since I had a yellow sticker instead of a red one, the red's the most dangerous guys, they keep you with, with the, the low-risk people. And after about a week or two in there, I went to the uh, veterans dorm. I'm a military veteran. And there were just uh, people in there more my age, you know, uh, there weren't any fights whatsoever. The, the, only, the only fights there were was another dormitory across the hall, which was a religious dormitory, and they had fights all the time. <laughs> all the time. Yeah, they're in there to see. Because when you go in the religious dorm or the veterans dorm, you can take classes to rehabilitate you, and they have all kinds of things like, you know, drug abuse. I learned more about drugs and meth and how they make it. And, you know, and what you got to go buy to get it, and, and the reason that you can't get uh, what you do with rubber cussing and how many things. These guys hand it down. They're, they're throwing little things of molecules, and you see, well, one molecule comes over from here and goes to there, which makes it this, and then you got to blow it, and then it does this. They hand it down. I was like I was talking to a chemistry engineer. Yeah, they had it all figured out. All figured out. And um, not to deviate from our subject here, but with Trayvon Martin, um, he went over and he got Skittles, and he also got uh, iced tea, watermelon iced tea. Well, those two ingredients plus Robitussin make something to give you a buzz. Uh -huh. Well, that didn't make the news, but you know, you get with certain people like me, they know all that stuff. <laughs> and, that, and I got out before the Trayvon Martin case, naturally. So, um, anyhow, uh, typical jail is um, to get you up at 5.30 to uh, feed you. Uh, it's either oatmeal, cornflakes, or um, grits, and a piece of cake. Everything's all carbs, you know. And then uh, nothing's ever cold, and nothing's ever hot. It's always like, in, like room temperature, everything. The food's a little warm occasionally. And then at lunch, it's about the same as dinner. You could get uh, iced tea with no ice, naturally, or um, some other clear stuff that TKO, I don't even know what it was. But you didn't get any meats except for bologna, and when you did get bologna, everybody bragged about, man, we might get bologna tonight. Whoa, great. Then I know I've been in there too long. Well, you start looking for bologna. You know, thinking, I gotta get out of this place. Okay. And then all of the, the patties, the meat patties, they're not meat, they're all soybean. Everything is soybean, and I never want to see macaroni and cheese as long as I do. Uh -uh. Forget that stuff. Gee, that's in everything. 
So uh, the only thing you got to look forward is, is what kind of uh, goulash you're really eating. But it's tolerable. But what they did is they used to have salt and pepper. Now I'm getting to the money part. But they don't even have salt and pepper anymore. What it is, if you want to season your food, you rely on people on the outside to put money in your commissary account. And you buy these romaine soup things. You know, the, the soups that are in the package, they sell for a quarter or maybe 15 cents. Well, the commissaries charge us 70 cents. They bring them in, you tear it open, you take the seasoning packet, and you put it on everything. You know, and then it makes it so, oh, now I get to eat some baked beans, you know, <laughs> because it just, it just tastes like everything else, you know. And, there, and your food tray, there's four different items. And they look different, but in the end, they kind of like, you know, taste the same. I mean, I lost 15 pounds, you know, when I was in there, because I, I just was giving the food away. I couldn't eat it anymore. But then as soon as my commissary account got filled up by the Patriots, and my brother was gracious enough to put 500 bucks in it, uh, then, then I started getting all the cheese whiz, and mm, I, got, I gained the 10 pounds back real quick because I was mostly eating the commissary food. And since nobody has any money in there or anything, you don't have any watches or rings, there's no personal possessions, the only thing you can deal with is food. So when, you're, when the chow comes, like at breakfast, you know, or lunch, you're always saying, uh, two pieces of bread for one bologna. They shout it out everywhere, so you barter around to get what food there is. So the people that don't have uh, any money, the indigent people, well, they'll do anything to get any food any way. I mean, they'll come into your, your uh, cell. By the way, the cell, once you get out of, um, uh, it, it, it was like a tiered two-story with an open thing. And the cell had like two people in it with a door. So there was a lot more privacy in there than when you're in like big open area. They have an open area like the day room, and then you can also go outside to the yard, which isn't yard, it's you know, play basketball in it or something, but anyhow. So that's mostly what you know, I could go on and on about that. So uh, anyhow, I was in there for 104 days, and then Judge Belvin Perry said to me, he wrote in his order that after 40 days I could go to work release. So after 40 days, I'm going, okay, now it's time to go to the work release. They said, no, you can't go to work release. We have it down that you're a gang member. <laughs> I said, well, what's the gang I belong to? She could, he, they go sovereign citizens. I said, well, that's not a gang. They say, well, do you have any tattoos? And I go, no. So, okay, so they took a week to figure out I really wasn't a gang member. And, and then, yeah, 66 back year old man, I'm a gang member. <laughs> so uh, after that, we... Um, Got through that one, and then I think Belvin Perry, and I don't know, my intuition tells me this, he made a phone call back and said, don't let him go to work release. Work release is you're out of the jail, you move into another building somewhere out on Cayley, and you have to stay there at night, but you can go out and do your job in the daytime, but you got to come back. Mm -hmm. Now, in jail, I ought to say this part, is there's so many people in there for victimless, nonviolent crimes that they just got to be making money off of this. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Exactly. Because they're arresting people, the indigent mostly, that are, um, well, let's see, riding a bicycle at night with no headlight or taillight. So they arrest them, put them in there. It's a misdemeanor, but they, they, they can't bond out. They don't have friends. They don't have 100 bucks. So they sit there. I mean, now we're talking like 30% of the, the dorm I'm in. They sit there for two months. The uh, state attorney comes in to them. It says, look, we really like you. We're going to make you a deal. If you plead no contest, and, and uh, we're having the hearing for you, your pretrial hearing, plead no contest, which is a guilty, they never say the word guilty, you, they, you can walk tomorrow. So anyhow, they go ahead and they walk tomorrow because they plead no contest, which is now a guilty hanging on them. This one guy named Gerald who worked at the Orange County Convention Center for five years has never been in jail yet. He had an apartment, no car, took a bus, worked five years. The two cops knocked on his door and they said, well, we got you for unemployment fraud from four and a half years ago, come with us. So he comes to jail, doesn't have the 100 bucks or 200 bucks to bail out. It's a minimum of 100 bucks. My bail with the red light cameras was, and I haven't talked about that yet if you're on too bored, is, uh, was $500, a minimum is 100 bucks, and that's set by the state. So the bonding companies with incarcerating people, they're making money like crazy. So Gerald, he uh, was about in his early 60s, picked him up, put him in jail, couldn't get out, didn't have anybody with the money or whatever. He lost his apartment, he lost his job, and two months later pleads guilty to, uh, to whatever. I, I left by the time everything else went on. 
And uh, so now, now the guy's back on the street, but he can't get a job. So now you and I are going to pay for all these companies that will say, okay, we can send you to a halfway house over here. Now, of course, you've got to report. If you go to the halfway house, you got to pay them 50 bucks a month, uh, a week or something. And then you got to pay some more money over here. So these people, to stay out of jail, got to go back into stealing to pay the system. See that little thing here, that circle? It just keeps going on and on. And then if they get busted again, well, now we've got to send you to another place that the taxpayer pays for. It's all the taxpayer, and they're getting money out of that. The phone system, and then I'll get away from jail for a moment. The phone system, if I want to make a phone call, you just don't go dial zero in the number you want like you should be able to. No. You've got to get somebody from the outside to deposit money in your phone account. Now, let's say they deposit 20 bucks. It's $2.75 to make a phone call that can't be more than 15 minutes. And it's got to be on the number, the 20 bucks, through the inmate phone system. And when you call that up, they say, would you accept a collect call? Well, they didn't collect call because somebody put 20 bucks on there. When you put in the 20 bucks, and I have to take Sharon right now, because she was the one that helped me when I was on the inside. <clears throat> she would be putting in. By the time it was all done, in the three and a half months there, it was 2000 $2,000 to spend on phone calls because I had to keep my business going. Thank goodness for my son. We're partners in my roofing business. And so, you know, I'm talking, you know, a few times a day. Now, if I call him in California, it's $15 for 15 minutes. And that's how they get the money. They're just picking away the phone, the commissary, all this. And, and people are feel sorry for people, so they put money in there. They also charged me five dollars for booking me, and it costs a dollar fifty a day to be there. I didn't want to go there. That's how much they're charging me. Right now, you can leave owing them money, but if you owe them money, in the end, you still got to pay them, one way or another. Yeah, yeah. Now they don't come and necessarily pick you up and put you back in jail for the money, but 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 they'll get the money out of you one way or another. You know, one way or another, they're going to get it. So anyhow, we go through this whole routine. It, it's just disgusting, and um, also the classes you take as well on the drug abuse naturally, because the other thing in there is, um, uh, let's see, VOP, uh, violation of parole or violation of uh, uh, parole or uh, probation. Thank you. And anyhow, in, there's a 90% failure rate, 90%. So when these people are arrested, they'll say, look, you just go on probation for two years, and you'll owe us the money, but forget everything else. And everybody goes, yeah, sure, man, I can get out of jail. They're right back in jail, and then it's contempt of court, and they can't argue against it. They can't go back to their first charter at all. And then the other ones are, are the people that are in there for sexual things, pedophiles and stuff like that. And once you talk to these people, you start believing that it, it's just something of some five-year-old that testifies against them. He couldn't afford a lawyer, and they're doing years, you know, and then they've got to appeal this mess. Once you're over one year in the local jail, then you go to the big stuff, wherever that is. You know, I'm not sure where that is. So anyhow, I could go on a long time, my experiences in jail. So let's see, we covered how I got into it, covered how I got incarcerated, and I'm out now, and I'm free. And I'm still trying to appeal this to the Supreme Court of the United States about First Amendment rights. And, but we're talking tens of thousands of dollars, and we can't raise that yet. We've got to find somebody that, that really is a freedom fighter that's got a loaded pocket. Okay, so that took care of that. And um, I'm still giving you abbreviated. There's a lot more to tell you about here, Julie and me and all that. It was all you board. Um, now, now we're coming to the red light cameras. Okay. Um, uh, oh yeah, wait a minute, I'm only back for us here. Uh, we're still handing out flyers at Seminole County Courthouse. Now, the Trayvon Martin case is coming up two months ago. Right, we're there. We go every Monday morning and hand out flyers. So Judge Dickey, um, the counterpart to Belvin, he wrote an administrative order. These are the tricky things, the administrative orders. That said anything that had an opinion could only be done in the free speech zone. So the feature flyers that I put around here for you, that could be the opinion of fully informed jury association. So they have to hand you the administrative order first, and then you have the option of leaving. So I went, hmm, how are we going to get around this one? So what we did, the very first day of their picking the jury, we handed out the Constitution. 
just to see what they would do with the Constitution. Who would throw anybody to jail for handing out the Constitution on the court house steps? So we're there for about 20 minutes, and then a corporal comes up and says, you guys can't be here. you got to be in the free speech zone. And we said, well, we're handing out the Constitution. He goes, oh. Well, he says, let me see it. So he takes it, and he's gone 20 minutes, and he comes back and says, okay, you can hand out anything you want, anywhere you want. Just because we were handing out the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. So that was a win. And then next Monday we were there, and the same thing happened again. We said, oh, no, we talked to officer so-and-so. It's already handled. And he goes, well, look, i got to search on this. Could go to the free speech zone while we're looking into this? I went, no. We'd like to stay right here until you check it out. And here's the officer you got to talk to. And, and then you throw out some words like, and also talk to Judge Dickey. You know, when, when you start saying, like, officer so-and-so and Judge Dickey, they take a step back and go, oh, maybe this guy knows what he's doing. So he'd come back 20 minutes later and said, yeah, okay, you're fine. Now, I've got to give another experience to this. This is Volusia County Courthouse about two years ago, and I was training a couple guys in their 20s. So we go up there, we're handing out flyers, and um, this sergeant comes out just snorting, carrying on, no, 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 shouting and screaming. And this was one of those guys that figured, you better do what he says. You know, you, you have to use, you know, when they come out of there like a juggernaut, you just, you better, you better take your, you know, pick your battles, do it another day. And they can't really do anything to you because you aren't doing anything wrong and they haven't had an administrative order. I gotta keep coming back to the administrative order. Because I want people to get active, but I want to show you there has to be administrative order. Seven minutes? Okay. So uh, the guy comes up here and he says, okay, uh, let me see your, um, uh, he says, he says, you can't do that here. And I go, yeah, we can. I mean, you know, freedom of speech. And I said, you can't do that here. This is private property. I said, private property? Who owns it? He goes, Volusia County. <clears throat> I go, well, it's Volusia County. I own it. He goes, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And there's like three or four cops there, and they're all looking at each other, you know, looking like a Keystone Cops is going to do that. And then the next thing comes along, well, we're handing out the flyers again, again we're, you know, and I had the two that were in their 20s not doing it. I said, let me do it. I'm still handing them out while I'm talking to them. He says, he says, no, 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 you just can't do this. You've got to leave. And I said, okay, okay, yeah, I'm going to leave. I'm lying. I ain't leave. I'm handing out the flyers. And he goes, I go, okay, I'll leave. But wait a minute. If I don't leave, what are you going to do? He says, I'll get you for trespassing. I said, okay. Go ahead, give me for, I'm leaving anyhow. Go ahead and give me for no trespassing. He goes, okay, he goes to the squad car, comes out with a pamphlet, opens it up, put his initials, put it in the date. And he goes, okay, give me your ID. And I go, well, I don't carry ID. And there's a silence, and he goes, okay, closes the book, puts it back in his car. They cannot give you a no trespassing order anywhere unless you have identification on you. An identification, not a credit card, it's gonna to have to be like a driver's license, a picture. So if you ever do any activism, never, never, never carry ID. Okay. So he comes back and he says, that's it. You just can't do it. You guys got to leave. And I go, well, okay, okay, okay. We're going to leave, sure. But, but wait a minute. <laughs> it's always great. I always say yes. But wait a minute. You know, if I don't leave, what are you going to do? And he says, he says, well, um, you just can't do this. I said, okay, okay, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to cause any trouble. I'm a patriot, a veteran. I'm not going to do this. Tell you what, I'm going to leave. Would you be so kind to go get the law or the ordinance I'm violating, and we won't come back? He goes, okay, sure. So he leaves. The three cops stand there. He goes into the courthouse of Lucia County, the land, comes back out and says, okay, you can hand out anything you want, anywhere you want. Okay. I'm about at the end of my speech here, and I didn't really get to the red light camera things that I was arrested a week ago. But and if we have time later, if you want, if you're not bored, I'll tell you about that because the red light cameras now, there's so many people mad at these things. It's a wonderful source for getting more patriots to join our cause. This is this is it. This is it, but you need it. Thank you. I'll talk later. Thank you. Okay, I'm at the end of the show here, and if you aren't bored, I'll talk to any of you later about the red light cameras because it's a real big deal. It's really important. Thanks.